Hello everyone, my name is Laurent Bernay. I work at Datadog as a staff engineer. And today I'm going to um, share uh, an interesting kind of issue we identified, um, debugged and fixed using eBPF. So um, a few words about Datadog. We're an observability company. Um, we have um, many customers, uh, about 2,000 employees, and a lot of different integrations. But today, we're not going to talk about the product. We're going to talk about uh, the infrastructure behind the product, and uh, which consists of dozens of Kubernetes clusters and tens of thousands of hosts. We already use eBPF extensively at Datadog, both on the product side for observability purposes, um, because we use eBPF to instrument uh, the host we monitor. And we also use eBPF for our infrastructure. We use it for container networking because we use Cilium everywhere. And we also use it for debugging using eBPF Trace, for instance. Um, the issue I'm going to discuss today um, started with the performance regression. So um, two, two, two teams uh, reached out to us telling that they were having issues uh, with networking on a few clusters. Team terms were packet drops and retransmits which uh, impacted throughput and latency. And as a consequence, uh, they had to create more processing pods and of course it was more expensive. What was interesting is that only some clusters were impacted. The old clusters seemed to be fine and the new ones were the only ones where we're seeing impact. We looked at the impacted application and the node they were running on. And after some time, we saw this weird behavior here, right? So ENA6 is the physical device used to uh, egress the VM, and it provides eight transmit queues uh, to provide better throughput. And as you can see here, we're only using the first one when we should be using the, the eight queues. Um, that, that, that's weird. And as we dived deeper, um, we by looking at the queuing discipline creation, um, we use the default Ubuntu setup, which means um, we use FQ Codel as the main queuing discipline. And because we have eight physical queues, uh, we also use the virtual multi queue uh, queuing discipline, which is going to send traffic to the different uh, FQ Codel queue, and we're going to have one FQ Codel queue per physical device. As expected, because we're only using a single device, we also use a single FQ Codel queue. Uh, as you can see with the numbers here. And what's interesting is the number of dropped, right? Uh, we were dropping about 2% of the packet. And the reason for this is um, the Codel queuing discipline is going to drop packets almost as soon as we start buffering to avoid buffer bloat and additional latency uh, due to, to, to buffers. Um, when we saw this, uh, we, we tested a mitigation, which was replacing FQ Codel with FQ, and that worked, right? Of course, it's not a real fix because we still can get to the maximum throughput of an instance, but at least um, we avoided the drop, which impacted uh, throughput of TCP traffic. When we looked at the um, receive queues, uh, everything seemed to be working fine. So it was only the transmit side that was impacted. So let's discuss our networking setup. Uh, we use Cilium in IPAM uh, ENI mode, which means every pod is allocated an IP from the VPC. And then routing uh, is performed on the host so that host traffic is using the primary instance uh, interface and pod traffic is using additional interfaces. So our issue was definitely impacting uh, pod egress traffic, right? This was what we were discussing before. So we wanted to know if others, other types of traffic were impacted. So we first looked at host traffic and it turns out host traffic was completely fine and we were using all the queues. Um, we also uh, wanted to know if it was related to the ENS6 interface configuration. So we forced some host traffic to use the additional interface and this was also completely fine. At that point, we were starting to think that maybe it was related to our CNI setup. And so what we did is uh, we created a network namespace manually and we configured it and sent traffic through it. And well, this traffic was also impacted and we're using uh, a single queue, so it was the same issue. We're starting to wonder, well, 
a VF device only have a single transmit queue by default by our ENS6 device as eight queues. What happens if we change the number of queues in the little SNA device, which we can configure? And so what we did is we created a network namespace and we're using a virtual SNA device with the same number of queues as the ENS6 interface. And when we did that, it actually fixed the problem. So let's uh, let's summarize. On recent clusters, we have network issue. Traffic is using a single transmit queue for egress. Because we use FQ Codel, this impact maximum throughput as soon as we have high throughput because we drop packets. And it only impacts traffic coming through a VF device and, and, and routed on the host. As a mitigation, we have two options. We can either change FQ Codel and use FQ, which is better but far from perfect, or we can use multiple take queues on virtual SNA device, but that would mean uh, modifying the CNI code we're running. It's a bit complex and it's kind of weird also because it used to work completely fine. So how do we debug this? The first thing we wonder is where should we look? So um, we looked at the network uh, call stack to, to send packet to see where the queue selection was happening. And it's happening in the net device subsystem. Here is a very simplified transmit sequence. What matters is we have two steps. First step is the queue selection uh, and then transmission. What's interesting here for, for, for our case is queue selection uh, is using the select queue function provided by the ENA driver, which we use on AWS. And, and after that, once the queue has been selected, we're going to go through all this transmit code, including queue discipline management and actual physical pen. But at that time, we're not going to change the queue. So let's focus on this select queue function. So this function is pretty simple. It's only a few lines. And actually, the, fact, the thing that matters most is the net depth pick takes function, which is the function that is used to compute a flow hash and, and pick a queue. And it looks like we're not getting there, right? Because this is definitely not happening. We're only using the first transmit queue. So let's look at the, at the test there. So this test is checking if uh, a field of the SK buff called queue mapping is different from zero. So for those of you who are not familiar with the kernel networking stack, an SK buff is a kernel structure where a packet is stored with additional metadata and queue mapping is one of these metadata. So what this code is checking is whether the queue mapping is different from zero. And if it's not zero, it considered that the queue has been recorded. If the queue has been recorded, it's restored by subtracting one. So now we need to know how these fields evolves uh, uh, as the, the packet goes through the kernel stack. To do this, we use BPF trace to look at the content of queue mapping as the packet was going through multiple functions. Here we have a simple example for the devq xmit function where um, we're looking at the SKB and getting the queue mapping fields. And for packets matching a uh, given destination IP, because we can print it for every single IP, we're printing some information and in particular the contain the content of the queue mapping fields. Let's do a very simple example. Um, connect to a, the network namespace of a pod to a ping, and here is what we see. Right, uh, we go through the probe twice, uh, one in the pod network namespace and one in the host network namespace, which makes total sense, right? Uh, but there's only something interesting there, which is the queue mapping field is different uh, in, in both cases. So let's take a more global look and add probes to more functions. So uh, we, we went through the call stack uh, of the of packet egress um, in the kernel and there are three groups of function. The first one are the ones called inside the pod network namespace as we send traffic from the pod. Then we have the functions uh, called inside the host network namespace as we receive traffic and, and, and route it. And, and finally, once the routing decision has been made, uh, sending traffic through the physical interface. Let's focus on the QMAP field now. So, while we're in the pod, um, it's always zero, which makes sense because we have a single transmit queue. At the very end here, uh, in the NA select queue function, the, when we start the function, the queue mapping field is set to one, which means 
the queue is considered recorded and restored to zero and never modified afterwards. And that's why we use only the first queue, which is exactly what we see, right? What really matters now is why do we transition from zero to one here? Because there's no reason as far as I know. What we did is we actually wanted to look at the code. And by looking at the BF XMIT code here, you can see that we're always recording the queue, which means we should always be impacted. However, we only think this issue on, 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 on newer clusters. So we wondered, was this always the case? And by looking at the history of the code, we actually found this commit, which was introduced in kernel 5.11.11. And as you can see here, um, before um, recording the queue was gated by a test, and now it's always happening. And this patch has made it to multiple kernels, and in particular, uh, the Ubuntu uh, LTS kernels. And that's why only the most recent clusters using the most recent Ubuntu's were impacted in, in, in our case. So how do we fix this, right? Um, First is, well, we, we, we chatted with the CDN demon, in particular with Daniel Borkman, who almost immediately told us, well, this is a bug and we can patch it. And here is a patch that's pretty simple, right? We're just not recording the queue anymore. And we tested the patch and things are now happening exactly as we expect. Uh, the commit is now not recording the queue because the queue is not recorded in a select queue with, we'll, we'll call netdevpictx, which will use a Nash function to compute the queue. So we're, we're good. What about existing nodes? So the problem with the kernel patch is you need for the code to make it uh, to the kernels we use, which can take time. And there again, uh, Daniel, who had worked on the kernel patch, told us, well, uh, the CDM agent is already loading EDPF code on the VS devices to perform a load balancing, apply network policies. And so maybe we can leverage this program to reset queue mapping and address the bug. And this is the mitigation here. Uh, thanks, uh, many thanks to, to Daniel for, for implementing it. As soon as we have this mitigation, we're able to build a new version of the agents and deploy it on, on, on clusters. And here is what you get, because these nodes have uh, old kernels, which are not patched. Uh, VXMIT will recall the queue, so set it to one, which we don't want. However, the new EBPF code that is by Cilium on the virtual standard device will reset it to zero as we receive the packet on the host side. And because it's zero, when you get to a nice select queue, it means we'll go through the hash code, which will pick the queue, and, and we're good. So what about our applications? And as soon as we deployed it, we, we did tests. And as you can see here, it was immediately fixed, right? We're now using all the queues. Using all the queue was, was nice, but that it impact our applications. Well, it turns out this period transmit, which were high, were now much lower, which was good. TCP retransmit are still a high level indication of issues. What about the application itself? And as you can see here, the graph is even more compelling. The P95 latency of our application went from seven seconds to a few hundreds of milliseconds, which of course was extremely good news for us. In, in conclusion, I mean, eBPF is, is very powerful, right? I mean, it makes it possible to, deploy, to debug very complex kind of behaviors. I mean, I'm in no way uh, an expert in the network stack of the kernel, but using PPF trace and very simple code, we're able to see the content of uh, the SK buff as it moves through the kernel stack. Now, many other eBPF tools, uh, uh, some of them focused on networking, such as Packet, Where Are You from Cilium, but many, many other. And in addition to being extremely powerful, it's also a very good way to learn about the kernel and its behavior and how it works. In addition, uh, eBPF also makes it possible to patch all the kernels without waiting for an upgrade. And that's amazing because waiting for upgrades can, can take a long time. And even when the upgrade is available, you then need to deploy it everywhere, which is time consuming and sometimes difficult. So eBPF makes this much simpler. And, and sometimes, well, it is a kernel bug. I mean, when we started, it was obvious to us it was an issue with our configuration, but it turned out it was a kernel bug. If you're curious, um, many more details in the in the CDM issue link here. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, if you have if you have questions, I'd be more than happy to to take a few. Thank you.